Andy Sobe. Hello. All right, it's so great to be here. And let's give a one big applause for the organiz organizers and all the volunteers all over here. Hey, thanks for making this happen. All right, we are Ossi Herrala and Mik I am Mikko Kenttälä. And that one guy over there is Sebastian. We are founders of SensorFu, but our topic today is escapology. So I think this term is not that familiar for everyone. So basically what it means is that it's like a art what the escape artists has performed in, in over the years. But of course, in our context, we are talking about more about isolated networks and so on. But nevertheless, restraints and other traps. How to escape from there? All right, so network isolation is pretty much a cornerstone of, of security in many organizations, meaning that if you have some kind of critical uh, infra if you are a critical infrastructure provider or factory or whatever you might have, totally segregated environment, or if you are like something like vulnerable uh, malware analysis or something like that, you might have a different lab for doing the analysis. So it's a pretty important thing, and the, I, I think the many organizations and persons are relying on it. So today we are going to demonstrate a couple of tricks. Uh, first topic is the VM virtual machine host only network. Uh, we are going to demonstrate uh, like a demo at the beginning of the show. And like Tommy and Timo used really well, that if you find it interesting, you might uh, stay along during the presentation and we will tell you that what's happening under the hood or what kind of uh, techniques we are using. So the host-only networking is basically meaning that if you have a virtual machine, you can create host-only network, which is basically uh, providing the connection between the virtual machines in the one host. And the, if you have multi multiple virtual machines, you, you might build a, a com completely contained network. This is from the VMware uh, website manual talking about the host-only network. So we have this demo set up over here. Uh, Ossi had a laptop over there. Only one string attached. It's the HDMI cable over there. And Ossi has also virtual machine running over there. And it's actually running only the host-only network. Ossi can maybe show the, uh, yeah, only one adapter. It, it's host-only network. So, whoops. So this should not be possible that I can actually take a connection between the OSI and my laptop. We are connected to the same Wi-Fi. Uh, OSI has host-only network. And let's see what happens. So it's demo time. Cross the fingers. All right. Ossi is already running the amazing chat over there. So I guarantee that we have a different IP addresses. Maybe we can check it. Yeah. We are from different subnets, and Ossi is only host only network. So if we both run the amazing chat, which we will do, let's see, can we talk to each other? Ossi, do the magic. Hello, Disobey. <laughs> All right. So something went wrong in the sense that it should be totally contained. Magic. All right. Then we have uh, another demonstration. Uh, we have a virtual environment. Thanks, Dai, by the way, to building this up. So we have a simulated internet set up, and we uh, demonstrate the, how we can escape from this kind of 
segmentation, or use one of the techniques what you will hear later on. All right, so I'm now in the, hopefully my SSH is working over here. Go down, all right. So I am now connected to the internal side, which is totally separated. Uh, we cannot communicate directly the, through the firewall. Uh, so the idea is that I cannot connect to the office side and office on the external side of the network. So we have another trick. Uh, I do not try to write this because it's too I'm too excited to do everything, so. so. So we have a message, which is, hello, this obey. This is a secret data. I'm leaking it from the internal side of the network. Uh, we don't have any direct connection to the machine, what OSI has over there. And uh, I'm running one binary. And we have a shared secret over there, which is this obey one. OK. Check. Yep. We have right. the algorithm Let's do it. secret. So now we are writing some information to the mysterious places, and it will take it time. Hopefully, it's working. So once again, fingers crossed. Why it's taking so long? All right, it's done. Let's see. This takes even longer, so <laughs> don't hold your breath. All right, so the idea is that. Uh, We are leaking information bit by bit with using one particular technique. And also, we'll talk about it later on and dive, it, dive in it uh, more, in more de with more details. Come Hopefully, on, it's on. working. <laughs> All right, yay. So the first one was escaping from the isolated virtual machine environment. And the second one is uh, like a more common in the bigger corporation. Bigger corporation organization. Uh, let's see. All right. Let's get back to the slides. OK. So. I think many of you, if you have been uh, following these kind of topics in the past, you will most likely know about these kind of things. These are really commonly used by red teamers and so on. So typical escapes are based on that there's uh, two wide firewall rules or uh, meant to be maybe not, well, you open too much uh, even though you need to have really strict policies. Yeah. And the really typical one is DNS tunneling, which is normally used in especially with the, some command channel uh, for the uh, command and control server. For example, it's based on the that you have registered your some domain and the DNS will connect over there and you get replies back. Then there's of course normally there's a proxies on the network which can be abused and there's a really typical thing like VLAN hopping that you can find out that. There's many times like a voice over IP or some security camera network, which is basically available in every network socket. And you can go there, and you have more uh, access to other places. So typically, if we go to the places where the, there is that kind of segregation, that there's an isolated network or office net, and office network and internet. And if we ask from the administrator that, please, can you give us some topology? And this is normally how it looks like. Because when we start to think that what kind of restrictions we have in place, we think it like uh, as it built. We'll, we'll come back to this a uh, little bit later on. So then there's a couple of tricks which are not new challenges, but are maybe not that commonly known. I have found out that you should try this kind of low-hanging fruit. So, for example, poor firewall rules. So only TCP, UDP, and ICMP are blocked by default. How many of you have an idea that what's, what might be wrong with this? Good, good one. But that's not all, because there's something like hundreds of diff other protocols. So normally, 
when you are building a restrictions, you might think that TCP and UDP and ICMP are pretty normal like uh, protocols, but you need to block. And if you want to try that, if your blocking is actually working, you will test those protocols. But it might be that there is, like I, once I had a, I get lucky with the IPsec protocol, which is in a total, totally different protocol. I couldn't get any connection to the internet or any other segments, but for some reason my VPN was working. Okay, so that was the reason. So you should check out that kind of things too. Uh, of course, only IPv4 is blocked. Is someone shouted out already that IPv6 might be working really well. And then the really common thing is that there's no anti-spoofing. So now into the more like uh, uh, different kind of tactics or techniques. Uh, forwarding basically meaning the IP forwarding. This is commonly seen in uh, firewalls and routers, which need to be enabled to get uh, packages from one interface to another interface. But what many of you might might be that you don't know that this can be enabled in other machines too. So for examples, you might have a Windows running or Linux running with multiple interfaces. So basically you have a multi-home setup and they might have, in those machines, there might be that the IP forwarding is enabled. So what that means, that you might have a machine between the networks, which has a multi-home. It might be DNS or it might be centralized logging or something like that. But it had, has two interfaces, and for some reason, IP forwarding is enabled. So pretty easily you can test those, but it's not like an intuitive thing that you will figure this out. So basically, I will uh, show you that you might get lucky with IP forwarding by sending the uh, packages with the, to the broadcast MAC address in layer two level. That meaning that everybody on the LAN will get that packet. You put zero, uh, zero, zero as a source IP. What that might cause is that host, the host, whoever is getting that packet, will add its own IP address to that segment. And then it will gladly forwarding the packet to the other side of the network. So basically, it's like a gen uh, gentleman seen before in the picture, forwarding the packages or packets to each other. Then there's the bouncing. Uh, this is not a new thing. Uh, application layer bounces has been happening in the past too. So most famous of those. I think, or at least one of the first, are the FTP, which was vulnerable, vulnerable by design since 70s, and the, it was commonly known in 97. And it, there's actually, uh, you can use Nmap with the FTP, and it's still there, and it's built in 97. So really common thing in that sense. But then there's also network layer bouncing. So you can use protocols like TCP, UDP, ICMP, uh, to send your payload in the network segment. Uh, this uh, might be look a bit strange, so basically the idea is that you send the packet to the default gateway, and it will reply you something, and, but you are spoofing your source address and uh, send it to the actual spoofed host, meaning that if Alice sends a packet and says, and the bouncer is the control mechanism. Uh, it can do it so that, hi, bouncer, I'm a Bob, which Alice is not, but he, it's saying, I want to say, how are you to Charlie? And bouncer is thinking that, no, 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 this cannot be happening, I have this rule. So it is answering that, hi, Bob, you cannot say, how are you to Charlie? And it's actually sending the packet to the Bob, which is on the other side of the network. And this really happens and can be used as a le uh, leaking of the some data. The good thing with the ICMP is that it will include the my, my payload is leaking data to that ICMP uh, request packet. All right, then we have a side channels, and Ossi will tell you more about that. Thank you, Mikko. So this goes to explain the second demo in a more detail, so uh, we have a side channel. It's a covered channel in a DNS cache. 
And uh, cover channel is, uh, this is my definition, it's using something not designed to transfer information to actually transfer inf information. Uh, there is nothing new here. In 2005, we found out uh, someone, uh, some anonymous uh, wrote about it in a RAC magazine. In 2008, there was an academic paper about it, but uh, both of these didn't really go to the actual implementation to implement it and release it. So uh, we had to try it out ourselves. Uh, can you guess the problem? We have some kind of shared resource between two isolated things. For example, CPU cache is shared between virtual machines. This was a big news just last week. Network services might share some kind of uh, resources between two isolated networks. Uh, one shared resource usually is a cache. Uh, it's used everywhere. There is a CPU caches, there is uh, HTTP caches, there is uh, browsers and so on doing it. And it can go hilariously wrong like we learned with the Spectre bug. Uh, caching is important. It makes things faster. It makes them more efficient. So we want to use caches, but we need to make it safe. Uh, we used a domain name service as a cover channel. So recap, we can translate names into addresses, addresses into names, and so on. Basic stuff. DNS cache, once again, it remembers stuff, and it makes user experience much better because internet works faster. So for example, here, client wants to know the address of example.com. But cache doesn't know it, so it goes out and asks someone who knows. And then comes back with the response. And finally, client knows the IP address of example.com. When the caching works, one step is missing, and things go faster. And DNS caching is everywhere. Web browsers do it. Operating systems do it. Local networks have it. There is even services on the internet, open DNS and Google's DNS are DNS caches, caches basically. But there is a one bit of information. If it's a cache hit or cache miss, it's one bit of information. And we can decide the value of the bit by measuring how long the query takes. For example, when it's cache miss, the query time might take 100 milliseconds. Something like that, it's the ballpark. When it's a hit, it's three milliseconds. That's really easy to measure. So now we know how to write a single bit in the DNS cache, and we can go further and write longer messages like you saw. We need to choose some kind of addressing. So uh, we need a stream of host names, 0.example.com, 1.0. Two dot and so on. We need to encode the message as a stream of bits. And we make a decision that every single one bit is a DNS query, and we skip over zeros. So writing on letter A is uh, just doing these two queries for the binary positions two and the last position. Reading is uh, simple as well. So use the same addressing system. Uh, we need to query every single address to get the every single value of the bits. If the response time was fast, the bit was one. If it's slow, it's a zero. So eight queries later, we can see that uh, information which was written was the letter A. Uh, more information about this, uh, Google Xipology, and you find out, or there is a GitHub repository. We wrote three separate articles explaining the fine details, which I skipped here. So check those out. And back to Mick. All right. Thank you, Ossi. And the, go and check that out. It's, there's really cool details under the hood going on. And one important thing with this is that compared to the other techniques or tactics used, techniques used before in the DNS tunneling, this doesn't need any existing domain. So you can do like a negative query. So there's 
you can query to the uh, non-existing -ex domain, and you will get replied. That's why it's working also inside of the contained or the more restricted environments. OK. Then there's mitigation. Most of you who are already familiar with this topic, there's nothing new. And that's over there because you don't need to do nothing new to get everything right. But the fact is that you cannot fail either because, well, because what you saw before. And there's a other techniques too. So I think if you take care of the default blocking, blocking policy and this spoofing and you understand that uh, there's, if you have really contained restricted network, you shouldn't have shared services between those isolated environments. And you really need to understand how multi-homing works. So if you guys still remember the topology what I showed before, if you start to think it from this perspective, you will figure out pretty quickly that there's actually plenty of things to try to get, try to get from the more isolated side to the other side. Of course, there's, it's another story that uh, if you have implemented everything right way, there's no that kind of options. But at least it was when we started this research, it was really surprised to me that actually how many ways there is to use some trickery to get rid of the, some of the, of the restrictions in the network. OK, we, our time starts to be up. So a couple of quotes. Uh, one famous person in Oulu once said, Sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> After all, firewalls are made for transferring packets. And this is something that you really need to an, uh, understand, because normally we think that firewalls are made for restricting the packets. But on the other hand, you don't need the firewall anyway if you are, are not transferring the packets. So it, this is kind of changing the mindset. Another thing which I want to pick from here, because as you saw, all of the tricks has some references in the, let's say, have been discussed during the 20 years. Maybe we have some new perspective and some new implementations over there, but it's nothing new. It's an old trick, what we just used, maybe a little bit new way or from new perspective, but you can do it too. And one more thing is that this is not the scientific uh, research. I know that there should be much more research done in this segment, so if you happen to be any interest to in doing it, I would be happy to share all the knowledge what we have and hopefully we get, can learn more in later on in future. And I guarantee that even though we think that th that segment is pretty commonly known, uh, that how the networks work, but I'm pretty sure that there's new ways to see it and new ways to do tricks. So, thank you. <laughs> and any questions? Thank you. One question about the typology. Yes. So how does it work in a sense that, yes, you can pass information by doing a query on one side and then see an effect on the timing on the other side? So there needs to be some kind of synchronization because otherwise the reader is going to ruin that particular bit. Yes. So I have difficulties of understanding how this would work in a practice for more than transferring just a couple bits or is there some kind of a timing protocol or something included in here? There is um, actually a funny story. I showed you the two prior art documents there. We found those, we skimmed through them, learned something, but we didn't uh, dig into the details. So we, we didn't use the methods they described. We invented something else, and it's, it's really quantum bit. So when you read it, you change the value. So uh, that uh, example we showed is a uh, simple read and write, write, or write and read. So the synchronization was that I know when Mikko presses enter and so, so when the bits went in, and then I could read it. That's, but. Uh, we have a more practical proof of concept, which we didn't show here, where we actually uh, use the key derivation function from cryptography
to generate the host names to write the bits into. And with the key derivation function, you can put some kind of time element there so that you get uh, new addresses for like every 10 minutes. And then you can synchronize just by using the clock if you know that you have a clock synchronization. And that's uh, another problem in isolated networks. Is that enough of an answer? Thanks. That's going to be interesting challenge for behavior analysis. For sure. And remember that you can go and check out the dirty details from the internet, too. It's available over there. Anyone else? Hi. Um, you had a glitch there in, your, in the demo about the missing char. I was just curious, what do you have an idea why, in the, in the chat, why that happened? Most likely, oh, yeah. Most likely, because the data is, this is really like an opportunistic demo. So we did it so that the data itself and the character itself is uh, encoded into the source port. And we are relying the bouncing. And the, there might be some packets lost when we are using the OSIS Wi-Fi in the, bo in the bone <laughs> <laughs> and the, in this environment. So that's most likely the reason. OK. Anybody else? I think we are good. So thank you, Disobey.